What's up, traders? Anthony Crudelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. Today, my guest is futures trader Damon Pavlados. Damon and I go way back to the days on the trading floor. Damon started a good bit of time before I did, and actually, at one point in time, Damon was filling orders for Paul Tudor Jones. These days, Damon moderates a trading room with his wife, who's a great trader and who's been on this show a bunch of times before, and that's Linda Rashke. Had a ton of fun today talking with Damon on a whole bunch of different topics. Started off by talking about what we're seeing in the markets right now, discussing how he and I trade rollover, the little bit of nuances in the markets when it comes to trading rollover. Then we went to the charts today. So if you're listening to this on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher, or anywhere where you're just hearing the audio, you got to check us out over on YouTube. Damon and I went to the charts where he pulled up his market profile charts and, and even more than that. And we went over how he uses the overnight markets to set up the trading day. This was really my favorite part of today's discussion because I'm somebody who really likes to see all of the indices working together and then I'll decide which indice I'll trade, mostly Russell, S&P, or NASDAQ. And what Damon does is he uses market profile in the overnight session and he looks at each of the indices individually and what's setting up overnight. Specifically, really, we went into the market profile side of things and how that sets up the day trade for him. I really think you're gonna find that very uh, interesting and educational. Remember, Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group. They are the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. You can listen to Futures Radio Show podcast anywhere where podcasts are available. But if you want to watch Futures Radio Show, you can check us out on YouTube or on my website, anthonycrudelli.com. This show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, TradeStation, and FTSE Russell. The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol RTY and micro E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. Damon, what's going on, my friend? Hey, Anthony. How are you doing? Good to see you, buddy. How's, how's things going? They're going good. Um, enjoying myself. Uh, have a trading room now, trading live with Linda, and things are good. Family's good. That's good. Market's a little crazy, which is good for trading. Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about here today. I know because I haven't seen you in a while. I mean, because last time we were together, we were in Chicago. We had a good time. I you know, hung out. We actually recorded a, a video back then, uh, you and I, when we were there. And, and uh, you know, I miss okay. seeing people that I know and I'm friends with in person. But it's good to catch up with you today and. You know, as we're recording today, today's March 10th, uh, you know, we're in the middle of rollover. I, I'm just curious. I, I want to start there. And do you even trade roll, rollover? What are your thoughts on trading rollover? Yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't do any uh, rollover spreads. If that's what you mean between like uh, March, June. Um, I trade it pretty much the same. I do roll over on uh, the Thursday before, you know, the last week when rollover starts. But I'm, I'm not, um, I don't take it, uh, I don't really seriously trade it as a spread. Yeah, I don't trade the spreads either, but I've always found, and people are always asking me, well, when do you take some time off? And I'm always like, well, I typically tend to take off the week of rollover because for some reason, things technically never work as well on my strategy at least. And I just always find that I end up getting a little bit chopped up on it. And that's why I was just picking your brain. Do you ever notice any differences with your strategy during the week of rollover? Um, you know, there are going to be some nuances. Um, for instance, the some of the platforms roll over a little earlier, like on, on the Wednesday and the Thursday, I tend to uh, not switch until Friday, even though rollover is technically on Thursday. Um, you know, when you're looking at charts, you got to be careful because the continuous charts, uh, for instance, if you're looking at the June 
early, right? You're, you're not going to have great history on the gyms because they're not trading a lot until close to the last week of March, right? So yeah. that's where the nuances come in, uh, looking at continuous charts and, uh, you know, versus like the actual June chart versus a continuous chart. So it's a little tricky. I use market profile, so that can be tricky uh, if, you know, when you're doing that rollover. So you just got to look for, um, there's a slight adjustment there between the spread where some major tops and bottoms might be based on the old contract and the new one. Yeah, for me, when I look at significant highs and lows, once we roll over, if I'm looking at moving averages, a lot of times I just go to the cash. Right. Because you know, I'm looking at it going, okay, where are we now until we get settled within the contract? That's why a lot of times, at least for me right now, I know that I'll, I'll even, I'm not really a big stock trader, but I'll sometimes trade like right now because it's been busy. Some of the tech names have been getting beaten up. So I've been trading a little bit of Apple and just things like that, just because I'm a busybody and I need, <laughs> I kind of need something to do when I'm waking up. But, and I've been really doing a little bit less in the S&P and NASDAQ just because of that role. I like to let it settle a little bit, but I think it's an important thing, you know, that you mentioned there's nuance to it because a lot of people don't understand, you know, the rollover and they don't understand that just the simple things that we were talking about, continuation charts uh, and things like that. And, and during this time, I've always felt the technicals can be a little bit, they're, they're, they just there's more about people having to do things in the role than the market is in its normal way of the market setting up for people that want to do things. Like I feel like there's a lot more hands being forced, moving in and out of months, spreaders, mm -hmm. things like that. I've kind of learned my lesson with the just kind of trading rollover too aggressively. I'm, I've I, it only took me maybe a decade to, to figure that <laughs> figure that out. But uh, you mentioned. You know, market profile, we're going to get into that today. Everybody, if you're listening to this on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spotify, you might want to go to YouTube at, uh, at some point and they're in this conversation because we're actually going to be showing some charts today of things that Damon is looking at. And Damon, what markets are you primarily focused on trading these days? So in the trading room that I have with Linda, uh, we both trade... Uh, multiple markets. She tends to trade some of the markets that I might not trade, but together we trade the ES, the gold, uh, crude, the EC, um, bonds. Those are the main ones that I trade. Uh, she likes to branch out and do a little bit more, and she'll trade sometimes the softs and the silver and then the gas, um, not gas. So I, I tend to try to keep it to six products and I'm a little bit more of a short-term trader. So I, I like to be out by the end of the day. So getting back to a little bit about your, uh, when you're talking about the spreading or the uh, rollover, if you're only looking at five and 30 minute charts and you're out by the end of the day, it's not so bad. But I, I, rollover could be confusing, of course, when you're looking at carrying positions overnight and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, so I look at six markets mainly, and those are the six that I uh, trade. And talking about nuance, what are you noticing right now that what you're seeing in the markets? I, 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 the other day I put up a, a tweet saying that right now, if you're trading gold, you got to be watching bonds. Really, the main markets I've been watching, and I've talked about this quite a bit lately. I don't really care if you're trading these markets or not, but I'm watching the bonds, you know, thirties, tens, and mm -hmm. I keep up the dollar just because I need to know what they're doing. Because to me, I, I like looking at what they're, what they're doing and setting it up possibly for what the day may be in equities, what the day may be in gold. I'm really mostly trading equities, gold, and a little bit of crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, and those markets to me right now are the primary things I'm watching. What are you noticing right now? Any nuance in, in the things that you're trading? So uh, you're, you're correct about the bonds lately with the gold. They've been pretty correlated uh, where, you know, that they almost look like they're zigging and zagging together. Uh, we're having some extreme moves in these markets, of course, because of these times that we're in. We're talking about a stimulus package of 1.9 trillion. Um, that's more than what we take in, I believe. And uh, so the, the gold is 
you know, and the bonds, they really have had some moves. Silver, um, you know, the dollar, you know, currently uh, had a good rally and, and, you know, the EC sold off and the gold. Now it's getting a little reversal. I'm finding some good support down here in the bonds. So I'll probably show you a couple charts. So I'll put some charts together longer term. Um, but, you know, we've had a really crazy 12 months. When you think about February 20th last year, making new contract highs, and by March 13th, I think it was, we hit rock bottom. We literally took out uh, three years of trading in one month. So th these are different times. And um, I, I think you've been there too, where I traded everything from the 87 crash, the 91 meltdown, uh, what, you know, the dot com. <laughs> it goes on and on. 2008 was crazy. This is just as crazy, I think, some of these swings that we have. And the market has a tough time interpreting what's going on. Um, there's a lot of si money on the sidelines uh, that came into these markets, especially uh, Apple and, uh, you know, Amazon, all the, you know, big NASDAQ stocks. And what's made it really crazy is those stocks have gone up so much. You take a look at Apple, I think they're a $2 trillion market cap. That's close to the uh, whole Russell index, you know, so it really makes these markets very lopsided. Not like it was before. The S&P 500 really didn't move on five or six of the big stocks like they do now. If you look at take Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, they're all listed in the S&P 500. Those four, you know, they get moving, they're about 18%, close to 18% of the S&P 500. So they're, they, they can really affect it. The other, other thing that's been happening is a lot of market rotation. Recently, you know, we're having shifts from trying to adjust things. You know, the, the, the NAS is now finally a, a lot weaker than the Russell and the, and the Dow. But usually to me, that's a sign of kind of fear, you know, uh, playing with the more uh, old traditional stocks and the blue, blue chips that, you know, maybe there is a little bit of balancing at the moment. So that's one of the things I'm kind of seeing that recently came into play, probably because, you know, the stimulus package, COVID, everything that's gone on, um, you know, there's a little bit of that. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, hearing you talk about, you know, how the NASDAQ's gotten a little bit weaker than the S&P and the Russell. One thing that I look at. It's currently. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. And it's, it's always shifting. One thing I look at is divergence days. And people have asked me about this on social media. They say, well, what do you mean by a divergence day? Well, a divergence day to me is when you know, NASDAQ's down, S&P's up or Dow's up and NASDAQ's down. And there's just a divergence between the indices. They're not working together. Mm -hmm. I find as uh, really trade more NASDAQ these days than anything that that's a tough day for me because hmm. you're getting pushed and pulled and I find that my stuff doesn't work as good. It, it kind of, I actually put a tweet about this uh, this morning talking about how knowing what not to do or hmm. when not to trade is just as equally as important to me as it is knowing what I'm looking for. I mean, in, most of us will find what we're looking for, and then we got to stay disciplined to that. There, there's, that's a challenge in its own right, right, David? Right? You know, we we, we want to click buttons, we want to do something, we want to make money. But knowing scenarios right now, I think that I shouldn't be active in is really one of the keys for me because we're going through a time, like you said. I mean, it's it's an interesting time that there's just so many things going on in the background that are having an impact on the market. And of course, you and I are going to look at you know our technicals and look at our charts, and we have our comfortable uh, you know setups that we look at. But I'm just looking at days to where I just can't even trade this stuff because I'm looking at it going there's divergence, it's rollover. I'm recognizing certain things. I'm curious about you coming into the day because you trade six markets, and I know that you trade you know a lot of you know equity indices focused a lot of what you're looking at. How do you go about trading a diversion stay? How do you go about deciding which one maybe of the markets on that particular day you're going to trade? 
indices. You're talking about the indices, right? Yeah, when you're looking at the indices, Russell, yeah. NASDAQ, S&P. Right. So there, it's kind of funny because you're, you made a good point. Years ago, uh, I would not get long the S&Ps unless I had some confirmation from the other three indices, or at least three out of four. Today, the S&Ps and the NASDAQ tend to kind of travel a little bit together. The Russell and the Dow you know, tend to do things together. So it's kind of like a little split between the indices. But what I do is I look at uh, each indice first separately. And if the setups in the S&P seem to be more lucrative, then I would trade the S&P, the ES. Now, I usually do trade the ES, you know, mainly for the room. Um, but, you know, the, the Russell, once that gets moving, it trends probably better than anything uh, out there, I think. Agreed. But, but they're they're definitely a different the Russell is a different animal. <laughs> you know? It is. Yeah, it's a, like a wild dog, you know, swinging it from its tail sometimes. But um, you know, I don't know. I think that you know, I take each one of them more so today than ever separately, and I look at them separately, and I make my conclusions. Like like today, I think that you know, Nasdaq is going to rally, and, but I think the spoons are up against resistance, you know? So, you know, you look at these different, you know, scenarios and uh, that's the best way to decide what you're gonna trade. Um, normally, you know, I like to trade all of them, you know, when there's a good setup, but you, you have to be selective so that you don't get confused trying to trade all at one time. I used to trade so many different things at one time, but I was a lot younger and a lot quicker, you know? So, uh, you know, I'm trying to relax a little bit and enjoy uh, trading, but not kill myself at the same time. Um, the old days, I used to take things overnight. Do you remember the old Globex uh, ticker, you know, when they had the Globex? Uh, the pager. Pager, right? You know, you can oh, yeah. see the quotes. I thought that it was, was like having a laptop on, on your belt. It was so big. <laughs> yeah, it was scary. It was crazy. And uh, it, it didn't help my, when I was single at the time, my single uh, life, because I kept looking, I was trading around the clock, you know. And so uh, things have changed. You know, I like to uh, be in and out, mainly because when, when you see my, uh, on Twitter, I think if you, you you, you have seen some of the uh, shots that I've done on Twitter or some of those charts with yeah, my every morning profile. I yeah, I, I felt like it was time to find a way to break them out into the Asia and um, uh, European session because that, for me, is a lot of data for me to look at when I come in in the morning to see how the market was uh, handled in all these other parts of the world because you know, when you break them out, then you know that, okay, this, this rally was during Europe and Europe did this. And that's probably why it really, and you look at these highs and lows and uh, previous days, uh, overnight lows and highs like that, and you can help map your day out. So that's one of the things that for me has changed since 2008. I realized in 2008, we're still tied together that you have to pay attention to the overnight markets. Back in the old days, I could move some of the markets. That's how thin they yeah. were, you know, when I traded. And uh, purposely, it was fun to do. But, um, you know, now, you know, we're getting, a lot of these moves are happening overnight. Have you noticed that? Like you come oh, in yeah. in the morning and you go, holy cow, Asia had this huge move. Um, so, but I just don't have, I don't have it in me anymore to trade after holy I, you know, Linda, Linda's a little different. She, you know, she is the energizer bunny, but I'm a little older and a little bit more tired. So I kind of like to enjoy myself after the close. But I have to say our house is not like any other house. Both homes that we have, we have like, you know, 10 screens each and, and uh, the character up all the time. And, you know, it took a lot for me not to come in my office at night because if i do and i see something next thing you know you're trading to 12 o'clock and you don't get the, uh, you know good sleep 
but um, but the overnight markets tell you tell me a lot what's going to happen the next day, especially you know uh, the indices. A couple things. One is I want to go back to where you talked about you know, how you look at each of the indices individually now versus before you'd almost want confirmation. And I'm still kind of in that old school kind of way for me, because what I like is I like to see them all going up or all going down. And they're all kind of confirming on my longer term time frame ish. And I like to buy the strong uh, if we have divergence days. And I, and I don't really like to sell the week against uh, if there's a divergent, I like to just trade the one that's up. So if I'm going to trade one, unless it's the Dow, it's probably the only one I don't trade. Um, so I, I guess it's funny, you know, it's just good hearing different people's insight. And I definitely think that in today's world, it's, it's really good. I think your method is probably better uh, to look at them individually because I mean, just look at what the Russell did at the beginning of the year last year versus the end of the year last year it was just a two completely different tapes. Uh, and the Russell for me, I was trying to swing trade it and hold it because like you said, intraday, I thought it was a little bit difficult, but I saw this big picture time frame thing setting up. Uh, but for my day trading, you know, I, we're, you and I both, uh, we've been doing this a while and I, and I do also like to kind of ease my way into the day and like, kind of, you know, let things set up and, and not be in a rush. And, and I, and I go back to even what I said and what I tweeted this morning is finding more things. I like to be forced in more now versus before I would kind of force things. Uh, and I am getting a little bit pickier with my stuff and it's over, it's helped me so far. So I don't want to jinx it. But the other thing I want to talk about is, cause we're going to take a break here in a moment is how the overnight market tells you what the day is setting up. Because this is important. This is why I like looking at your stuff every morning. I always look and gauge what, you, what you're seeing. Because mm -hmm. uh, you use a different strategy than I do. And I, and I like to see that uh, and what you're looking at. So I'm thinking we'll go to the charts. Um, have you pull up some things that you've been looking at as of late? How What the overnight look is and how it then brings a setup into the day. And, and how you focus on the indices individually uh, I'm excited to see that. Uh, and I, I think that uh, all the traders, like I said, if you guys are listening to this on audio, you got to check this out on YouTube in order to see it. So we're going to pause for 30 seconds. And then when we get back, we're going to go over some charts with Damon. Hang tight, traders. Sounds good. Get S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 by the slice. Just one-tenth of the pie. Trade the tastiest index futures, micro e-mini options with TradeStation. Get a piece of the pie now. Trade the global markets with trading technologies. TT is the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Learn more at tryttnow.com. Welcome back traders. Now on with Damon with some charts. Damon, loving this conversation so far and okay. You know, really, one of the things I'm really taking away from this conversation is just where I think we differ, but I, I, I like your your philosophy towards this. Is I, I think because I've become from the old school, one of my mentors actually taught me, you know, always looking at the indices together for confirmation. In, in a world right. now where really, especially over the last year and a half, they really are... I don't want to say less correlated, but a lot of times they're going to be doing their own thing a lot of the times. And this is one of the reasons why I like your stuff as to what sets up overnight into the day to mm -hmm. see what that indice is, is showing you from the overnight session to help you execute the day session. So everybody, we've got some charts up here from Damon. Damon, walk us through what we're seeing here. So I, I just picked a bunch of miscellaneous charts that we can talk about. Um, so you understand where I come from, uh, and you know what the things that I look at. So I, I brought, I just picked this chart because uh, you were talking, you, you were wondering about like what do I see overnight that you know helps me out during the day, right? So what you're looking at is a market profile chart. I know uh, there's some folks out there that don't know much about market profile. I get it, but it's not as hard as you think if you were just to think about these letters A, B, C, D. This is a 30 minute bar chart uh, market profile, which means you know each letter represents a, a 30 minute bar. So if you were to split it out, it would just look like a bar chart. And this is just put together into a, a bell shaped type, um, you know, uh, vertical type of uh, distribution curve. 
So anyway, um, I color coded these and broke these out into time templates so that I pretty much picked what I felt was a good time for Asia because let's face it, the time zones in Asia are completely different. Uh, you know, not completely, but you know, there's so many time zones, right? So uh, that's the blue. Then Europe is the next time zone. And then the red here is the uh, US time zone, the day session. That would be from 8.30 central to the uh, uh, four o'clock close. Now this is futures that we're looking at. So I picked this one because this told me that there is a bull trap here. And when there's a bull trap, we all know what happens, right? You know, you get a dog pile out by the lungs. And, um, and so I was watching this on this day. And what I like to see is this was a contract I made during Asia. Now, generally, you, you could go back pretty far and the US session will at least go up and try to test that and take it out. And then maybe it'll go down or it'll go higher. But when it makes a high like this in Asia, then a lower high in Europe, and then we open up right here and we can't even get close to it, it's telling me this could be a bull trap. And once the market sells off, this isn't usually a one day event. You get a little bit of series of dog piling out of these lots, and that's what happened here. So, and then you can you remember we had a nice spike after that contract high. Well, same setup here. We went up here. Asia did, made a higher high than the US session. Europe, a little lower. We opened up. We couldn't even get uh, above the uh, European high or even test it. And then we had this huge sell-off. Now, usually, I, this, this one here I just picked randomly. Um, when you have that kind of uh, major liquidation and we picked up steam right from the morning and it fell out of bed, usually these kind of reactions, which we've been having quite a bit of overreactions to one side, right? Cause these overreactions to the other side. And even like today, when the crude number came out, you know, the overreaction to the downside, I think we dropped like 80 points and then we rallied 150 or 160 and we went back down to the lows. That's very typical when you have these overreactions. So I always look for you know, a pause after an overreaction like this and then look for the market to come back, which by the way, the market is above here, <laughs> you know, after that. So, you know, I mean, we're trading around here. So that's one of the things I like to, uh, that these charts tell me when I look back and see what Asia did and Europe. I also look back to see where the, uh, you know, the tough spots were the point of control where it traded the most in the previous periods. You know, I look at the overnight highs tend to be good resistance, you know, when we retest these highs uh, or lows. Um, there's a lot more market profile than that, but that that's just uh, one thing I look at. Now, I have a bunch of charts and I, they're not in order, so I'm going to just go through here. While you're doing that real quick, what yeah. I want to talk about there, what I really liked about what you just showed us there is talked a little bit about nuance today, right? I mean, right. what's interesting to me is that you saw the same setup from the overnight to Europe to the U.S. And I'm looking at this and going, that's something that looks, it almost looks identical. Mm -hmm. And do you they notice do. Yeah. that there are times where maybe this is that one setup that keeps setting up. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I'll look at my strategy and I'll say, this is the one that's working the best right now. I just, it kind of, it doesn't happen every day. We wish they did, but when it comes up, it's like, that seems to be just like that one setup that is working until it doesn't. But is that something you notice with what you looking at the overnight into the days that sometimes maybe it's like this same setup that kind of just keeps reoccurring? Absolutely. I mean, this is a common occurrence. I look for uh, these type of uh, fake outs, bear traps, bull traps. Here's a, a bear trap. You know, after we went down, we took out these three lows. But once we got back above here, this white is uh, very light volume compared to the rest of the day. So we did this on light volume. Um, there was no confirmation. And then the market came back and started this move up. Uh, 
this is today, I just snagged it, uh, you know, but here's that overreaction, the downside, overreaction, the upside. And if you look from, you know, this move down here, we're right back to this area, which this ends up being resistance. Now, today, I put this square around here. What I like to do is this square represents to me, where does the market, you know, can the market have some craziness, you know, a, a, a breakout, a rally from. So I like to do this. And I, by the way, the Twitter charts I put up were just for Linda and some friends. I, it was easier to put up Twitter charts. I never even had a Twitter account till, uh, or, or, you know, I mean, I, I put like, I had a Twitter account back in 2009. I posted like five charts. I said, ah, I want to do this. And then a year and a half ago, uh, Linda says, you know, hey, why don't you just put it on Twitter and then I could see it and, you know, my friends. And uh, it's gotten some traction. I think I, I have over 12,000 followers. But what tells me is people are getting it and it helps them. I give, you know, a lot of uh, compliments because, it, you know, I, tr I put a lot of work into it. So I put a pivot in what my pivot is not like the old pivot from you remember the pivot on the floor, you know, you take the high, the low, and the close, divide it by, you know, add it up and divide it by three, and that's the pivot. And it's, you know, I don't know, there's some people still do that. Pivot is where I think the market is the over and under. Where it gets below it, you know, the market can push down. If it gets above it, I think it can rally. And <clears throat> so I use a lot of many things to determine that pivot. And I do that for myself, you know, so I know like, okay, we're above my pivot something's going on the square here though what sometimes i do this and i put arrows these are major levels i feel like if the market gets above or below there uh, we can get something going so like today actually we went right up to this high this comes in you know i put like 39.10 but at the time we got up to 39.11 spiked and it went down which by the way, these spikes are real important. Uh, when you see these tails, these single tails, it's, you know, you've heard it before, a failed auction, right? That's where the market ran out of steam where they caught longs or, or shorts. And uh, I always make a joke in the old days, if I can hear myself in a pit buying a new high, I was in trouble because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to drive the market to new highs, you know? So, uh, so that's what this is about, you know, looking at test rejects, you know, when they reject an area, that's a good resistance, those kind of things. But this here, uh, today we've stayed inside there and I try to decide what kind of day it's going to be. You know, it's a pretty wide uh, parameter, uh, parameters I have here, but we have stayed above the pivot and we, we stayed below this high. Now, I don't know what's doing behind me, but I'm not going to look and get into it until later. But this is how I look at the market. Um, here's some of the quickly, like in the trading room, we show multiple screens. Like I like showing uh, some simple screens here and I trade off the charts uh, so that it's easy to see our trades. Uh, but you know, I, I think you could take just a volume candle. These are volume candles. If you just lock me in a room with volume candle charts, you could still trade off of that and probably do fine. It's just the other, everything else is, you know, adds to uh, my thought process. And can, and you don't want to have too many things where you can't make a decision. So I usually keep up the S&Ps live and the NAS live here. And then I have a, a 30 minute and a five minute for the room. But I also look at other charts on my other screens here too. This is a volume profile you know, with some, you know, uh, paint bars that I have programmed in here, just showing me the, the five minute, this is the gold, by the way, and I was calling for a rally in gold, and we went all the way up to here, right before I, I got off, I took this shot this morning. Um, <clears throat> so this, this was the point of control, we stayed above it, that's, you know, above it, you want to be kind of long below it, you want to look out. But you know, we tested it came back above it. And we did test the highs uh, before I got off to talk to you. And here's a 120 chart. And the market likes to trade from what I call ledge to ledge. Like this is one, you know, heavy high volume area, and this is another one. And then down below, this is the bread, uh, bread and the tick and the 
the VIX. You know, I like to watch that for confirmation. Uh, this one here, I have some moving averages that I like to use, just a 30 high moving average, 30 low, a 10 close, and a 5 close, and uh, overlaid with a Kelper. But, um, you know, the, the idea, and, and then these are paint bars that I had programmed. So if they're green or, you know, we have uh, the reversals up, red, we're taking a break, maybe going down, you know. But th today was such a choppy day up here. It's not showing you a lot, but this is just a quick snapshot of one of my screens, you know. I wanted to show you a couple other interesting uh, charts that I just snagged for you. This is a yearly chart. And um, this this was the December sell-off, if you remember when the bonds, uh, they, they're talking about raising interest rates uh, back in that December of 2018. And this was that sell-off that we had and then the market came back. And, and, and I look at these major levels as uh, these reversals, I call them pockets, are things that you have to mark off, you know, and I, I just happen to draw some circles about these re reversals. And if where a market has a major reversal, there's a reason for it. So you respect those reversal areas until you break them. So it's like a pocket, you know, it, you're, you're, you know, I always make this analogy that if you put change in your pocket, you're expecting your pocket to hold. But if you put, you know, 20 quarters or 30 quarters, the more you start putting it, the change in your pocket, it might break and then it goes to the next level. This is uh, some, you know, some cool charts I like to look at. I do look at longer term charts. Here's the ES now, and this spans all the way from when Trump got in to the COVID high, right before COVID and then COVID low. So one analogy uh, that I use that I think is really important that bull markets and uh, bear markets are completely different in a sense that a bull market is a slow grind up. It, you're building, accumulating, building, right? But when bear markets, it's time to get out, they're done like that. I mean, uh, you know, or uh, corrections. And this correction took out three years, just like that. Uh, one in 2018 with the bonds, it took out, a, you know, probably half. Don't you feel the that corrections now or like sell offs are faster than they've ever been? Like they're over, like bear markets are yeah. over in weeks. Yeah, yeah, that. it's true. Well, bull markets do last longer than bear markets, but even like corrections, they, you know, they really, uh, you know, an upwards correction does not really take off like a down, downwards correction, no. you know, completely different. And if you think about it, it's kind of like building a high rise building. It's like 100 floors, you know, coming from Chicago, I'm using this analogy. Uh, you know, you can watch them build the base of the high rise for the whole year. And then the next year they build a hundred floors because the base is the most important uh, part of it. So it's like a book, you know, the bull markets, they go up, they go up, they go up. And when they come down, it's like you you built the building. It took a long time, but to knock down these buildings, it takes two, three days, kind yeah. of like bear market, you know? So the, the bull markets are like building up a fresh building, a hundred floors. Bear market is like, okay, it's time to take this building down. They don't take, a year to take it down you know, right yeah and you know i want to go over a couple of things before we get into rapid fire and just really to go back i mean a couple of things that i you know all the stuff that you've been putting up today consistency and the looks you know and, and the similarity of the looks i really like because even for someone like me who's not trading this strategy what i'm recognizing that you're looking for is that one similar look you know, some people will have different strategies. Well, maybe it crosses over a moving average or it hits a fib and, and they're not looking at the similarity of how that occurrence happens. With what you're seeing here, me being a very visual person, I everything I'm recognizing is like some of these looks are almost identical. And mm. that to me creates this confidence in, in what you're doing. And mm. I see more now how you go from looking at the overnight to then trading the day and then also how the overnight sets up to the day because my strategy wouldn't give me that same kind of look. And I think this goes back to everybody, no two traders are the same. And and I, you know, this is what I learned a lot from Damon is really just how if you're going to if you like this type of 
look that Damon is putting in front of you. What, what's interesting is, is just as I said, the consistency in the looks, and it just creates that confidence. And one thing right. I want to comment uh, too is how you go back and mark all of those important areas. For me, what I started to do, um, Brian Shannon actually taught me about this, and it was just anchoring VWAPs from there. It's something that I do from like, if I think we're a big area, like you said, a, a Fed announcement where it makes this dramatic move and we cross over, I like to look at VWAPs on there for periods of time and or like an earnings report on a stock or something on a specific day. I don't think enough traders do enough of this, Damon. I really don't because it's like we, you and I talk about really being present for each day and what we're looking at, but you put a lot of time in. This is basically like journaling on your mm -hmm. charts. This way, when something's happened, I think, are you doing these as they're happening? You're marking them. You're not going back and marking them. And over time, no, it's actually, like you have this log. Right. This one right here, for instance, I've been watching this rally, right? This is a weekly chart over the past year. You know, this is COVID, right? Yeah. This is the bottom. And since then, we've had this rally. And I, you know, I, so I'm looking at these, this yearly volume too, because that that's important as well. You can see right here, this volume, you know, and so, but meanwhile, you know, marking off the high volume areas and I'm looking at this trend, this was that big break that we had, but I put on my uh, Twitter, you can follow and go back and see what I said that that if we close below 38, it would be really ugly because that would have been below this trend line, you say, on the weeklies, you know, and, that, and it's a rough trend line because it's a yearly, but it's good enough. And you could see what we did. We tested it, probably brought in the week, you know, uh, the, we have the week longs liquidate and, uh, and where did it go almost to right to this high volume area that we spent uh, not too long ago. But where do we close? This is last week. We closed up here. So now that close, if, if we close below 15, I think 30, 38, 15 to 20 uh, this week, that could be dangerous. Now, I'm still bullish until I'm not. You see, it's just tricky, but you have to keep your eyes open on this area. When you do break a major level, you, you wait for confirmation if you're looking longer term out. And a weekly, you're, you know, if you're trading a weekly chart, you're not just going to get out, you know, get short and then get back in. Uh, you're waiting for a close below that. And then, and then who knows? It, it could be a two, three month break. But yeah. um, so I keep an, an eye on it. I think volume is really important. These, these major levels are going to be important tops and bottoms. Uh, back in the day, you know, in the pit. You were in the pit, you know, traders would write down the highs and lows and it's all about price behavior. We get, we get close to these highs. How are we behaving? Uh, exactly. A high, you go through it by a couple of ticks and there's no volume, nobody buying above the high. You better get short. You fade it. We go above a high and you see golden and everybody buying, you're going to go with it. You're not going to stand in front of that for your trade. Uh, you'll go with the wind, you know, behind your back. Right. Yeah, uh -huh. and one thing I want to say real quick before we get into rapid fire is yeah. the point of journaling this stuff along the way and marking it on your charts, whether you're doing it at the moment or going back and doing it at night and doing your homework, to me is when you get really busy, all of a sudden, those areas will come up on your chart. Because in a really busy market, you're not going to have time to go back and look and see which low is significant or high. When the right. markets are busy, you've got to have this stuff marked already because Right. To me, it's always about preparation. Mm -hmm. I talked a little bit today about both of us, really, you know, we're, we want to really more be forced in. We, we want, we're not going to come in and just, you know, force to trade overnight or this or that. We, we really, I think as we grow, <laughs> it's a process, right? We, as we do this more and more, we, we want to wait for really to have a stronger hand in the market. And you do that all through preparation. I mean, look at how much preparation everybody that Dame is putting in into his charts. I mean, I love it and definitely learned a lot. But Damon, we're gonna we're gonna end here and we're gonna end up going into rapid fire. And I'm really excited for rapid fire with you because my favorite rapid fire segments with all my tra all the traders I have on here are the guys that have been around for a while. The older school guys, always fun to hear what you guys think in rapid fire. So traders, we'll be back in 15 seconds with oh, rapid fire with go. Damon. 
Let me Go just ahead, point this chart out two seconds. This is uh, today's bonds and bond chart. And the reason why I brought it up is we're at a pretty key area here, this 155. And uh, I think the market, you know, could hold up here a little bit and catch up. It, it already caught a bounce today. But I'm just oh, 30s, 155. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you interrupted yeah. me and said that because this yeah. is like we said, a market we've been watching. So 155 is a big area. The Real big quick. area. And, you know, I think that's kind of a pivotal area. And I think we might hold it. So. so this is if we were to get like a daily close below this 155 area, then right. you would then, see. That could be a little bit, you know, uh, bearish at this point. No, but we already had a hell of a sell off. Uh, this is from the COVID shutdown. We had that big, you know. Yeah. Rally and and then this is like the drip, drip, drip. And then once you get some momentum going, you get this kind of thing happening. But I wanted to point out when you see that kind of move, you, you want to look over here. There wasn't much substance on the way up here. So the same thing will happen on the way down until you get little price overlap and some real serious, you know, support and volume. This is a typical of a possible short term bottom. That's all I wanted to say. Oh, that's perfect. I'm really glad that you shared this chart. Traders will be back in 15 seconds with Rapid Fire with Damon. Okay. Why did I add futures to my trading strategy? 24 seven access to diverse global markets like wheat. Can you say growth opportunity? Uh, we should probably harvest that. All right, traders, back here with Damon for our rapid fire segment. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Learn more at tryttnow.com. Damon, first question for you. Mm -hmm. What trader has influenced your career the most and why? Mm. So I think... I'd have to say Paul Tudor Jones. I uh, executed his orders back in 86 to 87. And prior to that, I, you know, I, uh, I, I had a charting service and I was managing operations and executing for uh, Shirts and American Express. And he was one of my clients. But, um, you know, he taught me quite a bit about price behavior. I, because he came from the floor. So we're very similar. He came from the, you know, cotton exchange. Uh, he was a technical or a technician, uh, primarily, I feel. And when I, and when I saw his charts, I went, wow, okay. You know, he, he, he's just like me in a lot of ways, but I learned a lot from him. So uh, I'd say Paul Tudor Jones. How has your trading process evolved over the years? Wow. Um, so I went, I went at, in 86 up to 86, I kept thinking more is better. Right. So I kept getting new, new features, new, uh, strategies, new, uh, all these different things, uh, to my charts thinking the more, the better, right. You know, GAN, Elliott wave, you know, regular technical analysis, moving averages back when I was hand doing charts. But I realized that it's not how much you are uh, using, it's what's useful. Um, and, and can you make a decision and can you be consistent when you look at your charts? And like you said, you see some kind of consistency when I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm very uh, much into volume, so I keep that as a big tool. Uh, I have my set moving averages. I don't sway from the couple that I use. Uh, I like market profile and am very much about behavior, price behavior, how it works and, and, you know, deciding two things, if, you know, what kind of day it is, if it's a trend day or if it's a scalp day. So I've changed the way I look at things through the, throughout the years a bit, but I've, the key word is simplified it so that I can make a clear decision because, you know, if you had too many things, you, just, you know, it, one system might say buy, another one says sell, another one says, you know, don't do anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, should I stay or should I go, right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, it's really important that you have something consistent that you look at, that you know that this is a buy signal, I'm buying it, you know, because all these things line up perfectly. Yeah, I mean, consistency. Change, you know, like, uh, more isn't better, you know, I, 
I don't think you need to watch 50 different traders and try to learn from all 50. You need to find one trader that makes sense or one strategy that really makes sense to you that you can execute. Um, there's just so much uh, information overload. Oh, know. yeah. But if I mean, you simplify it, I mean, the market is all about price behavior, volatility, volume. Those are the major key things. You know, you identify all these things and then, you know, put it to some simple uh, chart fundamentals or technicals and you go. Yeah, I, I've always felt that consistency in trading comes from consistency within your preparation, because without that, you're never going to be consistent. Next yeah. question, Damon, what is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? Discipline. <laughs> I mean, you know, trading is such an emotional um, roller coaster. And, you know, the more you've traded, probably the, you know, the easier it, it is for you to take the swings and maybe be more disciplined. But you really have to realize that, you know, this if you're trading for a living, you really got to be disciplined because it doesn't take much to spoil like a good weeks of trading and a good month or a good year. Um, unfortunately, some of the best traders that lost everything, they lost their discipline one day and they had too much on and got stubborn and, and lost it all. So discipline is probably one of the, you know, major key things. I mean, there's a lot of other things, of course, but, you know, if you don't have discipline, all this stuff means nothing. Favorite book about trading? Well, you know, reminiscence, uh, reminiscence of a stock uh, operator uh, was one of my favorites, mainly because I like stories. I like, bi you know, biographies. Uh, you know, he went through some ups and downs, obviously. It didn't end good, but, you know, it's amazing his journey. Some of his quotes are really interesting and, you know, they speak to me and it was just a great book. You know, uh, there's a lot of books out there. I'm not a huge book read, uh, book reader, especially ever since YouTube. It's so nice to just watch and hear somebody, you know, rather than read a book, you know, cause it, you know, for me, a, I get ants in my pants. You know, if I read a book, I, you know, I'll go about an hour and then I'm like, okay, I'm done. You know, and pick it up another time. Linda, she can bring a book to the beach and read it. I mean, she's just, you know, we're different people. But yeah, that's just one of my favorite trading books uh, in general. So, What's the best piece of advice that you, throughout your career, have received about trading? Hmm. Well, get, going back to keeping it simple, uh, you know, that's definitely one of it. Uh, one of the uh, pieces of advice through uh, the mid eighties that I learned kind of from Tudor, just looking at what he looks at in general, some of the, the better uh, traders that I executed for, um, keeping it a little bit simple uh, would probably be it. Um, there's so many things though, but it's hard to say the best advice. Uh, the other thing is controlling your risk because, you know, you want to protect your assets. Um, you might have a series of five trades, you know, two losers, two winners, and one scratch, right? But those two winners need to be more than what you risk on the two losers and you know, for the most part. So your risk is really important. And, uh, and then keeping it simple, you know, don't, you know, really understand that this market is, about all of us it's an auction and um it, you know these runaway markets sometimes you know they're emotionally driven so you get the overreaction on one side it's an overreaction downside so price behavior is really important so you know i learned to keep it simple watch the price behavior which by the way when i talk about the auction process i had a liquidation company i probably went to 200 auctions. So there is a real story behind that. And I'm not gonna get into it now, but it, it it is all true. We're part of this whole auction. And it's, uh, markets are driven by many things, you know, uh, fear, uh, greed, um, 
you know, uh, emotion, you know, it's not all about supply and demand because if you think about, you know, if you think about like, if you, you know, for those who never traded the dot-com rally, you know, you got, you have to look back and go, are you kidding me? You know, Yahoo went from $9 to 300 back to $9 or something like that. You know, uh, that throws all the, that supply demand stuff out the, the window. It's all about emotions, you know, what, you know, you know, or look at GME. <laughs> oh, that thing is, I pulled that up on the ladder and I'm just like, well, you crazy. know, what's that trade is like crazier than anything that we're trading. Right? Yeah. You know? Today I mean, it broke a hundred bucks and I think on a five minute bar, it was like yeah. 350 to 250. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Again. Yeah. We were looking at that today. I said, what the hell was that? You know, it's crazy. <laughs> not, you know? not for me. I tell you that yeah. right now. A um, couple more questions left. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice about trading, what would it be? Hmm. That, that's a good one. Um, well, you know, make sure that, you know, when you're trading, you're, you're trading uh, not too many products. And, you know, to be a, you know, um, like a professional market maker, right? You know, if you're going to trade the ES, learn everything about the ES, learn, you know, the S&Ps, you know, do your homework. Um, definitely do your homework before you come in. You see my Twitter chats, they're all marked up. You know, all my charts are marked up it, so that I don't have to sit there to the last minute and make a decision of, is this good support? Where did that, that level come in? So do your homework. This is definitely something to do. And also, um, you know, when you pick a strategy, make sure it's a, it's coming from somebody who has some experience, who's showing you the strategy, uh, test it out on a simulator. Don't get crazy and just throw money at it. There's quite a few things, but I thought that I'd say doing your homework and, uh, and keep your life balanced so that, you know, you, you, you can focus on your trading. I mean, that's, there's so many things, but that would probably be it. Last question for today. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in trading, what would you say? Uh, so, the things that are really important about trading is, you know, understanding what kind of market you're trading. Uh, so one thing I learned from being on the floor of the exchange that I've carried on that has stuck with me, market profile also helps me with this, is try to decide what kind of day you're dealing with, what kind of trading day. You know, after, you know, a Monday, uh, after a Monday holiday, you know, the markets, you know, kind of went their way back. You know, uh, you usually don't get big follow through. Uh, you know, if it's a day before a holiday, don't look for breakouts. Um, you know, so try to decide what kind of day is it? Is it going to be a scalping day or a trend day? And then you trade accord, according to the type of day it is. So if it's a trend day, you want to, you know, be buying dips if it's a trend up and stay with the trend. You don't want to be trying to be cute and sell the rallies. If it's a, uh, you know, kind of consolidation day, then you, you should be looking to sell rallies and buying dips against major levels. Those two things are so important, I think, before you do anything. If you don't really know what kind of day you're dealing with, if you can't try to figure that out, you, you won't know how to, to execute or uh, pull the trigger and when to pull the trigger. So. Yep, Damon, I learned a ton from you today. I've learned a lot from you uh, over the last several years. The more we speak, the more I learn. And I really appreciate you taking the time today to, to chat with me. Tell everybody where they can find you on Twitter mm -hmm. and also uh, the, a link to the website for The Room with you and Linda. Sure. So on Twitter, it's at Damon Ovalatos, um, D A M O N. P A V L A T O S. So at Dame Poblanos. And then 
we have a website that you, you can go look and see about our room. Uh, it's Linda Rashby and myself. She's my wife, full disclosure. Uh, she was a client for 15 years, but we're trading together. I am devoting all my time to the trading room now. I stepped down from being a partner or a uh, CEO of my firms, and I'm enjoying my a little retirement in trading. And we trade in front of you know, uh, all these different people and we show our charts and we have fun and we, it's, it's a really fun trading room. We, we uh, have some classes, some guest speakers, we teach during, uh, a little bit during the trades. So when we put on a trade, we explain you why we're doing it. And, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, one day you come and join us, but the uh, website is uh, Linda and Damon, D-A-M-O-N, trade.com so linda and damon trade.com you made it simple and, uh, <laughs> you know what i mean it's like yeah it, it's you know like, when we were trying to come up with a name we're I just said, well i don't know <laughs> we, we, we're both trading from them so linda and damon trade.com yep that's how we came about it and we said good enough right make that's it simple. perfect just keep it simple like trading right that's so awesome. uh, yeah if you're interested um it's pretty reasonable and you can do a six month or a month to month. It's up to you. Well, I can't think of two better people to go and learn how to trade from than, than you and Linda. Damon, thank you so much for uh, coming on Futures Radio Show today. Thank you, Anthony. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes. You can listen to all of our episodes on futuresradioshow.com, iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.